church, that's why we're here. We're here today to praise the risen and reigning King, the Jesus Christ that we celebrated his resurrection just last week. He's still alive today. I've got news for you. And that's good news. Hey, we're glad you're here. Before you have a seat, would you just connect with someone around you, say hello this morning, and then have a seat. Thank you. shipping together. My name is Christy Smith and I'm the director of women's ministry here at the Loop campus and it is a joy and privilege to welcome you here. We want you to know you are so welcome no matter how you came this morning, whether you are happy or you are hurting or somewhere in between. We just want to come alongside you and we not only want you to feel welcome, but we want you to feel cared for. So you can help us do that by texting the word connect. If you have something that you want us to pray for, if you have any questions, about our church or anything like that. We just wanna come alongside you in your journey because we want this to feel like home to you because it is a church family. And then if you've been visiting Houston's First for any time at all, and you've got some questions about the church, what it means to be a member or how to be baptized, today is a great day because we have the Make It Your Church orientation directly after this service. It is gonna be in the Fellowship Center here to your right. And we've got a free lunch. You're gonna hear from staff members. You can ask questions. Again, just how to start the process to join, to become a member, to be baptized, to serve. All of those things can happen at the Make It Your Church orientation right after the 11 o'clock service. Everything we do here, I hope you know, is about discipleship. It's about going and making disciples and being a disciple of Jesus, just following him. We don't wanna just believe in him. We wanna follow him. And so all the events we have here at Houston's First are about that. And this Friday, April 12th, for our married uh, adults and then for our parents, we have an event called Stronger. And we're going to have an author and speaker, Justin Early, come and speak to us. He's written several books, but one that is my favorite is called Habits of the Household. And it's about establishing godly rhythms in our household, in our marriages, and in parenting. And don't we need that in this crazy, chaotic world we want some godly rhythms just to sustain us. So we have that going on. And then the following week for the ladies in the room, we have an event on April 18th called The Gathering. And this is a night of discipleship where we are gonna be focusing on the attributes of God and what that means to us, how our identity is rooted and secure in Him. And so for both Stronger and The Gathering, you can look in your message notes and you can scan the QR code there to register. Make sure you're a part of that. We wanna keep growing and becoming more like Jesus so that we can go and then share our faith boldly to a world that so desperately needs it. Church, we're just so grateful for you because all of these events are made possible because of your ongoing generosity, because of your commitment to worship the Lord through giving. We're able to just give quality events like this. And so if you want to jump in on that, you can text the word GIVE to 44322, and it would just be a joy. You can grab a generosity envelope in the seat back in front of you or scan the QR code. But we just want to invite you as part of discipleship to just worship the Lord through giving. And so now I want to hand it over to our missions pastor, Clark Reynolds, and he is going to give us a very exciting announcement about the world mission offering that we took last week. Well, thank you, everyone. I like getting applause when I just walk out. I haven't said anything yet. That's fantastic. And thank you, Christy. Hey, I love my job. First of all, can I say that? I love my job. Pastor, I love my job. Thank you for uh, allowing me to serve you in this way. I want to tell you something before we announce the number. This year, the World Mission Offering, if you remember, our goal was $2 million. That's a very, very large goal. And uh, we had over 2,100 givers to the World Mission Offering this year across all our campuses. Yeah, come on, let's, let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. And you know, giving is discipleship. Giving is worship. And we're excited to say that 15% of those givers had never given to the World Mission Offering before. So we're excited for that too, that there are more people joining in the work of ministry. So let's celebrate that as well. 
And you remember, I said our goal was $2 million, and we didn't hit it. We beat it. Light up that tote board. We did $2,075,000. That's, that's worth celebrating. The Lord is good, and it's giving through Houston's First. All of that money is going outside the walls of Houston's First to further the work of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is the mission statement of Houston's First Baptist. So all of you who participated, thank you so much for joining in. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for his goodness. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how you have called us to be a part of your plan. You have called us to be a part of the Great Commission. And you don't need us, Lord. You could do it any other way. But you've chosen to include us and to make us part of that plan, the privilege of giving our very lives and our very resources to fulfilling the Great Commission. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this world mission offering. We pray that as it goes out the walls of this church, that the impact would be felt for all eternity, because that's the plan. We want, to know, we want people to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So thank you for those who gave. Thank you for the giving spirit and the generosity of this church. Lord, thank you that you give through us exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask and imagine. We want to thank you. We give this offering to you, Lord. We give this day to you, Lord. As we continue in worship, we give that to you as well. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. As we continue worshiping, I just invite you into a moment of surrender, a posture of surrender, lifting your hands, maybe closing your eyes kneeling where you are, standing where you are, but the Lord is here. As I was praying this morning, I just kept remembering when my children were young and they would snuggle up close, rest their head on my shoulder and, and just relax into the love of a mother or a father. And I think this morning, the Lord is just inviting us to come close to surrender, to relax into his presence, to know his deep, abiding, sustaining love. Like Christy said a minute ago, no matter how you've come in the room, he's ready to receive us. Are you seeing this with me? And you're the light of the world and you stepped out you open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. The hope of a life spent with you. And here I Here 
Colossians 1 gives us a great picture of who Jesus Christ is. He is before all things. He reigns supreme. He has authority over the universe, and he's the one we worship today. Colossians 1.15 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all the creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. This is Jesus who we set our hope on, set our eyes on. There is a day coming when the old will pass away. Every wrong will be made right. No darkness, no night. The sun will light the way. There is a king coming, one who conquered death and grave. No more pain, no more sorrow. This hope for tomorrow is our hope for today. We lift our eyes to this, to Jesus. He who was.
Yes, Jesus, you are worthy. You are holy. You are good. And you're coming back again. We thank you for this hope today. Lord, I pray that these would just be more than lyrics that we're singing, more than songs that we're lifting up, but it would be the posture of our lives. Lord, to wait on you, to sing your praise, to thank you, to give glory to your name. Lord, would these things be true of our lives, not just our songs. Lord, we pray in these moments that you'd speak to us. We're ready to hear a message from you. We're ready to hear, to obey, and Lord, to see you do your work in our lives. I pray, Lord, for clarity over our pastor as he shares this word, and God, that we would just truly hear a message from you. We love you. We worship you. You are worthy of it all. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Man, what a day it's been for us to hear about the World Mission Offering, to us to be in church today, for Sienna Cypress downtown, Digital Family, Radio Ministry, Loop Campus, everybody be together worshiping. I want to tell you some great things that are going on in our church, because it is just too good to not celebrate with all of us. We have a ministry here called Legacy 68.5, and it's our adoption, foster care, and kinship ministry. It's based off of Psalm 68.5, which says God will be the father to the fatherless. And so over these last about 13 years, we've given away about $2 million to help fund adoption with matching funds included to that and help to have about 200 plus kids be placed in homes for adoption all throughout our nation, really. It's been an amazing thing. And I just want to bring you in on something that's going on right now. I just thought this is something I just want us to celebrate together as a church. We've had some, some babies placed with families in our church just recently. And I want to tell you about them and show you some cute pictures. Clark and Brianna Saunders are amazing people in our church. We love them, obviously. And they serve as valuable people in our church. And so we just love them so much. In the fall, we gave them a grant to be able to um, help with adoptions. Very expensive, cost tens of thousands of dollars. You and I, as our church, were able to give them a grant. And now they just welcome this sweet baby boy into their family. Isn't that awesome? Let's just cheer for that. Pretty cool. Amazing. Secondly, Howard and Hannah Solis, they are also great members of our church in our Siena campus. And they have gone from two, uh, or from one uh, little baby to two little babies. So their family of three is now a family of four. And we were able to help them with this grant as well. And so now they've welcomed this little baby into their home. And we're just so grateful for that. Can we get a little cheer for that? Just applaud. So good. Michael and Danielle Obringer, um, they are members of our Loop Campus. And they are amazing folks as well. And they have adopted, just placed two baby boys that have been placed into their home for adoption, and they're in the NICU right now. So we're going to pray for them as a church and just lift that up as a word of prayer for God to just bring healing to those little boys, for them to be able to come home to that wonderful, loving family, and to be able to have that is a great time. Um, Garrett and Heather Henson are part of our Cypress campus, and they're actually here today. I'm going to ask that they would come up, if they would come up for just a second. And y'all welcome them as they're coming up here. So exciting. They are on the waiting list right now, and they're in the process to receive a baby into their home. And we as a church, we get this wonderful opportunity. Adoption's very, very expensive. We are going to bless them. We want to give you $10,000 towards your adoption to help you with that. Awesome. Thank you. So good. So good. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for these little guys in the NICU. And let's just lift it up to the Lord. Isn't church fun? Isn't it great to be able to come and just see what God's doing in some amazing times? Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you're at work, Lord. You're doing something. We pray for Garrett and Heather as they wait. Lord, it's hard to wait. And that you would place that little baby girl or that little baby boy, that perfect one, uh, for their family, just what you want to do. And so we pray for them, Lord, and we thank you for that. Thank you that we as a church can help with this very expensive endeavor 
we're glad to do that. We're excited to do that. We can't wait to, to meet this little guy or this little gal growing up in the church here. Lord, thank you for all the families we've talked about. We pray in particular for the Obringers. Lord, we lift them up to you and these two little baby boys in the NICU. Father, we believe in miracles and we believe that right now in this very moment, you could be bringing healing to those little boys. Give the doctors wisdom, help them, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. We trust you with that, Lord. We thank you for all the adoptive families, foster families in our church, kinship families that are helping in so many ways. Lord, we thank you for the birth moms and dads as well. We respect them, we love them, we honor them. And we just pray for them as well. And we give you praise, God, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can y'all just cheer for, for these guys real quick one more time? So good. Thank y'all. So good. Yes. All right. Man, that's the way to start off a message right there. Good, good stuff. You got your Bible. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 1. We're going to take a little break. We've been in First and Second Timothy, as you know, if you've been tracking along with us. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1, because if you remember uh, way back a long time ago, it seems like, but we, um, every quarter, I'm going to do kind of a one-off message on more in 24, that we want more in 24. And what I've done is I put it in your listening guide, the things that we've been talking about. So last time we talked about more purpose. We want to grow in our faith through prayer and Bible engagement. Today, we're going to talk about more peace in our lives. Next quarter, we'll talk about more passion in our lives to discover our gifts and share with our church and share our faith with people, make a difference in their lives. More of my people, that we would get our family and friends around us even more to spend more good time with those that we love in such a way. So I'm taking just kind of a each quarter a thing to just say more in 24 and let's go along. This one's going to be a challenging one for us, I think, for most of us in the room. And it's because our, our more peace has got a clarity statement with it. I want to show you what it is. More peace. And here's what it is. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. Okay. We're going to say that confessionally together as the white part of that is what we're going to say together. And you can say this, if you're a student, you got school, you got activities, you're busy with your friends, you're busy, busy. If you're a senior adult, you're trying to make all the grandkids games, you're busy, busy. Everybody in between, busy, busy. It's just a part of our culture. I'll show you in just a second. But let's say that white part together, all campuses together. Here we go. Count of three, one, two, three. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. One more time. Say it from your... I say from your busy, okay, you ready? One, two, three. I'm too busy and will create margin and seek rest. Well, what you just said is statistically true. Six out of 10 adults feel like that they are in America, I feel like they're too busy to enjoy life. 60%, six out of 10 on a different survey, feel that there are not enough hours in the day to complete their to-do list. That means that more than half of Americans feel like they do not have enough time in the day. It used to be that busyness was something that we didn't really respect and lift up, and it was leisure that we lifted up. We said, oh man, that guy's really something. That gal's really something. They play golf twice a week. They do this, they do that. But now what's happened is busyness has become a status symbol. Harvard Business Review. Busy, busyness has become a status symbol. People also consider those who exert high effort to be morally admirable, regardless of their output. Famed basketball coach of UCLA way back when, he said this, never mistake activity for achievement. Never mistake activity for achievement. But we're busy, busy, busy. We're going, 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 and we are worn out, and we need a break, and we need a rest, and we need to just kind of say time out. So how do we get peace in our life? How do we get a, a restful heart? How do we get a peaceful heart? Well, we're going to see it with the life of Jesus here in Mark chapter 1. Before we jump there, let me give you uh, just a funny thing that I read. It was a little story. A guy wrote a, a kind of an allegory of somebody that was learning English, came to America to learn English, and they thought that the word busy meant the word good because everybody they asked, they said, how are you? And they said, busy. So they just assumed busy must mean good. And we see that in the statistics. But let's see how Jesus Christ handles it. I submit to you that Jesus should be the most busy person in the history of the world. Lots of people to heal, lots of sermons to preach, lots of things to do, lots of miracles to happen. He's sure busier than me. He's sure busier than you. 
Could be, but look at how he handles it. He's gonna have a big day of healing. He's gonna spend the night and then we're gonna see what happens on the next morning. So what happens after this big day? We're gonna see a time of recovery, if you will, um, in verse 35. Look at it. The scripture is gonna give us our outline. I'm gonna just really walk through the scripture and give you every point I'm gonna give you. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. And Simon and his companions searched for him. And then when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Is that the understatement of the year? Everyone is looking for you, Jesus. And he said to them, let's go on and go to the neighborhood villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. The first thing about more peace, more peace requires individual effort. More peace requires individual effort. You can't just hope for it. You can't just think, oh, it's going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're, you're not going to you know, get more fit by just hoping it happens. It's like this with this peace as well. It requires individual effort. I love the verbs that we see here talking about Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, he went out, he made his way. So there's individual that effort that has to happen. Now, there's two parts to this. Number one is find a time, find a time. It says very early in the morning while it was still dark. Now, I know all of us, some of us, whoever of us, we say, well, I'm not a morning person. I'm not this or that. You know, at some point, you got to be a something person, right? So find what, if you're not a morning person, you're not an evening person, you're not a lunch person. I mean, when are you a person? I mean, what's the deal? When's your time? When are you at your best? Let's find that time, your green zone, it can be called, and to be able to say, let me put in there my time with God in that place. So here it is, very early in the morning, while it's still dark, Jesus had a really busy day. He didn't sleep in, there's a place for that too, but he got up and he said, I'm going to spend time with God. And in that place, he found that time. Do you have a time? See, intentions have to be turned to action. It's not just gonna accidentally happen. Do you have a time? I want us to see the personal responsibility in these statements. Because we live in a culture where personal responsibility is not, not what we do anymore. We blame somebody else. Parents, you gotta teach your kids personal responsibility to understand they are responsible for their deal. You're responsible for your deal. Jesus has personal responsibility here. He wakes up early in the morning while it's still dark and he goes out to a deserted place and he has his time there. Do you have a time? Do you have a time? Is there a time set? If we were to ask you, would you say, yeah, okay, I got a time. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, in the morning, right before I get up and I get the coffee going, what do, you, what do you do? What's your first thing? Is your phone your first thing? Is your coffee your first thing? Is your Bible your first thing? Doesn't have to always be the Bible, but is it a priority in there? Is it really happening? And to be able to spend that time, remember in college, there was a big debate on if you spent time with God in the evening or did you spend time God, with God in the morning? So I just decided, oh, I'm going to grow twice as fast. So here's what I do. I'm going to tell you everything that I'm telling you, I do. I spend time with God in the morning. Right now, I'm reading Ezekiel, and I don't really like it. Ezekiel's not a very exciting book to read right now, but it's okay. I'm going to make it through. It's the Word of God. It's great. Honor the Lord with it. I'm reading Ezekiel in the morning. I read our church devotional in the morning. I got my journal, and I write a little bit in my journal in the morning. Then I go to the evening, and I spend time with God in the evening. So I'm sitting in bed, and I got my, my uh, I have a five-year journal, which is really cool. And I write down little things that have happened every day um, for, for five years. Uh, I'm only on year three, but I'm going to keep doing it. It's really great. I, I take out my Bible that's on my nightstand and I read some of the gospels every night before I go to bed. Kelly and I often pray together. And it's a morning and it's a nighttime thing as well. And because of my job, I spend time with God in the daytime too. It's awesome. But to be able to have that when's your time, which you could say very early in the morning while it's still dark, you got to have your time. If you don't have your time with God, you'll never find true peace in your heart. Number two, you gotta find a place. It says that he went to a deserted place, a desert place. This is an interesting Greek word. This is what they use for, remember John out in the wilderness with locusts and honey. This is a word used for that place, a deserted place. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness with, with Satan to be tempted, that's the word used for that deserted place. So he goes to a deserted place, a place that's different, a place that's lacking. So I've shown you, I had it up on stage here. I've, I've got a great chair that I sit in in my study. There's not a computer within arm's reach. My phone is not within arm's reach. The window's not really much to look out of. I am in a deserted place, if you will, sitting there where the focus can be this. Nobody else around, door closed. Dad's spending his time with God. 
You have a deserted place. And let me tell you what, you're probably not going to be able to do it in the middle of the kitchen when everybody's wanting breakfast. You're going to have to find a place that is a lacking place where you hunger for the things of God, an alone place, a distraction place. So I have had for years in the back of my car, have one of those Academy fold-out chairs, five bucks, has Academy on the back. You get free advertising for them. You open it up, sit down in it. I keep it there. Why? Because I go to Memorial Park sometimes and I'll just pull it out on a pretty day and just sit there. Go to the beach sometimes in Galveston, just sit there and just be able to be in a deserted place alone, be able to receive. See, here's how it works. Here's how it works. Let me give you the, give you the journey. You learn to spend that time. It's like a muscle memory. You learn to spend that time with God on an individual basis, each morning, each night, whatever it is, or both. You spend that time with God. And as you spend that time with God, then you say, I'm going to spend a morning with God. Then you say, I'm going to spend a day with God. Then you say, I'm going to spend a weekend with God. Now you're getting to some depths of the soul of God doing something in you. But you got to start with that little bitty time because it is really hard to develop that muscle. We get and we're spending time with God. We're like, well, that's great. 30 minutes. All right, let's go on. Yeah, and we're moving on to the next thing. And instead, to be able to learn and to grow, can you spend time by yourself in solitude? Well, we obviously can't because in the Harvard Business Review as well, they cited an experiment of a psychologist that found with his colleagues that 67% of men, okay, so guys, we're not as good at this, 25% of ladies, the lower number is the positive, they gave them a choice. You can sit in this laboratory room and just be with your thoughts, or there's a button here, and if you press it, it will give you an electrical shock. 67% of the men press the button to shock themselves. <laughs> Fellas, what's wrong with us? What is that? 25% of the women... They had an electric shock. Ladies, a quarter of y'all are crazy. What is up with that? <laughs> what happens? We just can't sit still. So we want to figure out what it is. So what happens is we will do this. Have you ever been on a vacation and you get home and you need a vacation from your vacation? You're more tired than when you left because you went and you saw and you did and you did all these things, boom, 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 all these things that were happening. And what happens on that vacation is we take our type A, we take our go get it, we take all these things and we move it and we just shift it to vacation. We're still checking boxes. We're still checking up on our email from work. We're still doing this. We're still doing that. And we just put another frazzle into our life. We got to find a place. We got to find a time. And so here's the deal. We're able to say, look, I want to learn how to do this. Maybe a 15 minute increment is all you can do. So they can move to a 30 minute increment. So I can say, you know what? I'm going to spend a morning just, just thinking and reading and I'm going to really rest. And maybe that'll turn into a day. I spend a day. I've done this for for 20 plus years now, I call it TWF, Time with the Father. I have a day every single month called Time with the Father. I work on the ministry, not in the ministry. I get away to a deserted place. I read things I've been stacking up that I need to read. I don't look on Sunday's message. I look on Sunday's to come messages. I pray about things like Kainos we just did. I get the, 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 um, the mapping out of the future. You can pray for me. I got another one coming up. And what I'm trying to do on that one is to say, God, what book of the Bible do you want us to teach in the fall? so that we can be ready for there. Because I know my life well enough. If I just go week to week to week to week, I'm going to be coming up really dry at some point. So I want a time with the Father to be able to, to get away, to really work on, not in. What if you worked on your family, not just in your family? What if you went, some of you that are close to retirement, you ask God, what's your vision for me in the next chapter? What if you got away with God for a morning? What could he speak to you an entire morning with God? What could he do? I bet you it'd be the best four hours you spent. Or we can just look at our phones and look at our computers. I ask you a very convicting question. How much time on your phone each day does it take to accomplish God's will? How much time on your phone each day? And I got one too. I got a nice one and it's big and it's got the world on it, you can see. I mean, it's... How many hours? Average says that we look at our phones 144 times a day, that 57% of Americans consider themselves mobile phone addicts. Over half of our country considers themselves mobile phone addicts. That's not the ones of us that are in denial about it. 
three out of four admit to feeling uncomfortable without their phones. Three out of four admit to feeling uncomfortable without their phones. So that's 75%. Almost half, 47%, say they panic when their battery drops below 20%. Oh, yeah. And roughly half of teenagers, 13 through 27, so even further than teenagers, worry that they spend too much time on their phones. So how much time does it take to accomplish God's will on your phone? Because it's just sucking us dry over and over and over. Now, you got to use it. You take pictures with it. You email with it. You shop with it. You know, you, you do phone calls with it. You text message with it. It's, it's a part of our world. I get it. It's totally that. But do you ever just toss it? Yesterday, we ran some errands, and I realized when we got in the car backing out of the driveway, I didn't have my phone. I went, awesome. <laughs> we went and ran errands, and you know what? The world went on. Everything seemed to go just fine. And I didn't have it sitting in my pocket ready to buzz at whatever moment it is. There's a golden hour, parents, golden hours. From about six to nine, if you'll focus on your kids, you will find those three hours will pay back dividends. You can work on something after nine when they're studying. You can do all your work all day long. But six to nine, you eat dinner, you spend time, you talk, watch TV together, enjoy one another's company, help them with homework, whatever it is. But you just make that a focused time. You find a place, you find a time, and you let God do his work. A little bit of time turns into a morning. A morning turns into a day. A day turns into a weekend. And then you go on vacation and you realize, wait, we really got something going on here. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Let me move a little faster here um, to keep on going. Verse 35, let's look at it one more time. It says this, very early in the morning while it was still dark, he got up, that's Jesus, went out, you see personal initiative, and made his way to a deserted place. We talked about that. And there he was praying. There he was praying. More peace requires praying, not just playing. More peace requires praying, not just playing. We must connect with God. Here's the, the big thing. Write it down in your notes. The peace of God is connected to the presence of God. So more peace deep in your soul. I'm talking about soul talk here. I'm talking about deep things in here. You're not going to find it on Carnival Cruise. You're not going to find it on a trip. You're not going to find it on a fall foliage tour. You're not going to find it going to a sporting event. Those are all great. Love them all. Awesome. Hope you have a great time. All of those things, though, there's got to be a place in which you realize peace requires praying, not playing. And that's why we go on a vacation or we go to an event and we're worn out. And we're so tired and it was supposed to give back and it actually took from. And instead, we've got to say there's praying that happens, not just playing that happens. And so that's got to be a part of the deal. I remember we went on a vacation and then we connected with some other parts of our family on vacation. And so they were staying here and we were staying here and we went over to where they're staying. We we're going to have a campfire. It's going to be a wonderful time. And so uh, I said, hey, does anybody have a Bible? This would be fun to read a verse. We we'll have some kids read the verse. And uh, somebody grab your Bible. Nobody, these are all believers, I love them, all believers, nobody brought their Bible on vacation. And I didn't say anything. I mean, you know, I'm the preacher in the family, blah, 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 so I just keep quiet. I'm like, that's the best time to bring your Bible. Now you have the time to read it. Nobody had a Bible. I went to church, they all were believers in Christ, but... Nobody thought the Bible instead of sunglasses. It just got left. Playing has its place. Praying gets to your soul. And many of us are soul tired. Deep, deep soul tired. A trip's not going to do it. And an activity's not going to do it. A sporting event's not going to do it. And a movie's not going to do it. I do all those and love all those. They have their place. But it's not the same. Accidentally missing a meal is not the same as fasting a meal. Having a day off of work is not the same as having a Sabbath. Do you see it? Playing is not the same as praying. And it says that Jesus went out and he prayed to God. Soul refreshment is deeper. And if you learn that, you get that, it'll become a keystone habit, meaning this, a habit upon which all other habits are built upon. But too many of us are looking for it to come other places. Let me give you the action point here. Um, I forgot the action point on our first 
um, uh, point, but you can see it there in your listening guide. Second action point is this. I need more prayer, more Bible reading, fellowship, or you fill in your own blank, whatever you need. What do you need more of? To get soul refreshment. Number three out of four, more peace requires realizing the same things will still be there. This is a big one, guys. The same things will still be there. Look at what happens in verse 36. Simon and his companions, so that's the disciples, disciples and followers of Christ, Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. We need you, Jesus. We need you. He's knocking on the door. We need you. We need you. We need you. And here's the deal. Let me just tell you, parents, you're always going to need, be needed. Your job is always going to need you, employee. Your school, kids, is going to always need one more element for you to study or one more practice to have or one more shot you could take or one more coaching this or that. Always, always in need. You know that it will never end. You and I have to stop it because it will always be someone needs you. And here's what we've done. Many of us are over-responsible. So anybody's need takes over our life. Learned this from a church member. I love this phrase. We stole it from them for our family. Not my circus, not my tent. Just because there's chaos over there doesn't need to be chaos here. And we care, of course, we love, of course, we're gonna help in whatever way we can. But that chaos, their problem in marriage is not our problem in marriage. Their problem over here isn't our problem here. And we've gotta be a little bit more removed to say not our circus, not our tent. I don't mean that disrespectfully so that we can be removed from it so we can step into it healthy and whole to care for them and to be able to minister in that way. It's actually a love to them. Only secure people can truly love. Insecure people are always looking for something to get out of that relationship. So I wanna be secure in my relationship with Christ so I can step in and truly love and care for that person. And when we end up in a time that we don't realize the same things will always be there. Moms, your kids are always gonna need you at some level. Dad's always gonna need you at some level. I know it's different at empty nesting. There's always gonna be that. Kids, your school's gonna need you. On and on it goes. Work's gonna need you. It's a 24 seven job we all have now. We can get, can get us anytime we want, right? Or anytime they want, I should say. Simon... And his friends are going to, I say this as reverently as possible, bug Jesus throughout the entire Gospels. And here's what we have to learn. You're juggling. There's rubber balls and there's glass balls. Some balls you can drop and they'll bounce. Your email will bounce. I promise it will be there. Work, most of it will bounce. It'll be there. Your marriage is a glass ball. You drop it too many times, it may shatter. Your relationships with those you love and your family, your friends, it's a glass ball. You drop it too many times, it'll shatter. Do you have any friends you're like, well, I'm, you know what? I'm not calling them anymore. They never call back. We never talk anymore. And the glass ball just kind of hits the ground. Rubber and glass, spend your time. You got to have both, but to be able to hold those and know what's precious. Do you know it's always busy? Well, it's New Year's. It's busy. You know what, spring break's coming up. It's really getting busy. You know, the end of school, man, it's always busy at the end of school. Summer, goodness, our summer is packed. Back to school, oh my goodness, we got so many things to do. It is so busy. Thanksgiving's coming. You know how the holidays are. Christmas is coming. Oh, it is so busy. Start over. New Year's is here. Oh man, it's so busy. Spring break is here. On it goes. It never ends. Simon is always knocking on the door. Let me give you a, a song that I love. I've quoted it to you before. It's by Sarah Groves. Just one more thing. Here's what it says. The title is Just One More Thing. There will never be an end to the request upon your time. It's your place, personal responsibility, to stand up and tell the world you've got to rest a while. Everything is important, but everything is not. At the end of your life, your relationships are all you've got. And love to me is when you put down that one more thing and say, I've got something better to do. And love to me is when you walk out on that one more thing and say, nothing will come between me and you, not even one thing, one more thing. Man, that hits us all with guilt. And there's compassion that God can forgive us and he moves through us and we can get it wrong, but we can get it right again. Let me just tell you, husbands, what your wife needs to hear you say is, you know what? I'm not gonna work. I wanna be with you. That'll bless her. Just stereotypically, I'm just calling that out stereotypically. Of course, that could be ladies working too, of course. Just stereotypically, wives, what your husband needs to hear is, you know what? 
The kids can fend for themselves. I'm going to focus on you. And I just want to love you. Just stereotypically, that could happen with the dads as well. No question. Everybody's so easily offended in our society. All of us are sinners, right? Okay. <laughs> but there's so much love and worth that happens in our heart when someone says, you know what? I'm not doing that. Let's me and you hang out. That happens with friendships. That happens in parenting. That happens in relationships. That happens in marriage. That happens with all these different things. And then there's other times you got to say, you know what, family, I'm going to have to be away because this is busy season for me right now. And I've got to, I've got to really dig in for right now. Christmas for my family, dad's gone. See you later, right? I'm going to be here for about a week solid in that time. Easter Sunday, not a family vacation for us, right? But that's okay. We're glad. Well, I'm not griping. I love it. It's awesome. You got to know your wife needs to hear these words. I will be back. Your husband needs to hear, I will be back. But what we do is we go after the rubber balls and we let the glass balls fall to the ground. We need to rest. We need to acknowledge we're limited. We need to acknowledge God is not limited. We need to acknowledge we cannot do it all, but God can. We need to acknowledge that God is God and we're not. And then what will happen? Here's the payoff. You ready? Here's the payoff. It's in verse 38, but listen to the point first. More peace brings refreshment and purpose. So Jesus has had a busy day. He slept for the night. He got up early in the morning to spend time with God. He's spending time with God. And then they say, everybody needs you. Everybody needs you. Everybody needs you. So he stands up and he says this on verse 38. Look at this and see if you see refreshment and purpose. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. This is why I've come. More peace brings refreshment and purpose. Do you see him? What's the first words he says? He stands up and he says, let's go. Let's go. That's refreshment. And that's become the phrase of sports, isn't it? Let's go. I mean, it's like, and I'm just trying to give a little psychological experiment here. I want you to watch and notice how excitement looks like anger now. You see somebody win a game. Yeah! it looks like they're furious. When they're trying to fire up the team, let's go! It doesn't look like any fun is being had at that moment. Could it be we're so unrested that even our excitement has a tinge of anger in it? And we're not just getting out excitement, we're getting out anger as we scream, let's go! With a contorted angry face. Watch, watch. I think Jesus stood up with a smile. He said, let's go. This is why I came. You thought I came to heal. I came to preach. I came so that I could tell people about the grace and the blessing of God. Let's go to the neighboring village. And then I love what he says at the end of the verse. Did you see it? This is why I have come. Do you have your, this is why I have come in life? This is why I've come. This is why I'm here. It's my purpose. So if you walk with God in a peaceful way and you spend good time with God, what you'll find is you'll find that there'll be refreshment and there'll be purpose. And you'll say, you know what? This is why I'm here. I'm here to be a lawyer. I'm here to be a business person. I'm here to be a doctor. I'm here to be a teacher. I'm here to be a pastor. I'm here to be a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a student, an athlete, or whatever. This is why I've come for this season of my life. This is what I'm supposed to do. So let's go. Let's go. I spoke at something recently, and Kelly didn't go with me, and I was driving back, and I called her and said, well, how'd it go? I said, I think it went great. I said, but this... I don't know, I just feel like I was made to do this. This is why I've come, in a sense. I mean, it's the best message you'll ever hear, doesn't it? Just, it's what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I've got to keep spending time with God, and you've got to keep spending time with God in the early mornings, dark of the mornings. I'm going to play, but I'm going to pray. I'm going to have the presence of God. I'm going to have the presence of others. I'm going to be with friends and family and eat out and have a great time. Those are all very important. But I want to get in there, and I want to get in there deep enough so that my time each day is spent with Him. So that time each day can say, you know what? I'm going to take a morning, and I'm going to take a morning, and I'm going to learn how to spend time with God in a way I can really think through some things that are important in my life. And then I might take a day with God. And then it might even be a weekend. But you've got something right now as we close this message. 
this is your Sabbath right now. And you just made a great decision to come to church, either online or Sienna Cypress downtown, Loop. This is your Sabbath. What will happen with the next 10 hours of the day? Will it just be flurry around? Will you just try to get this message out of your head? Or will you say, you know what, God, I heard you. That's your last action point. Lord, I hear you saying, and you fill in the blank. And take this Sabbath moment and try to get with God to realize the purpose in your life so that you can say with a smile, let's go. You know, Sabbath's work. Chick-fil-A is doing a pretty good job making money. And God can do something in your heart a lot more than he can do with selling chicken. God can do something in you. So, ball hit over the net, personal responsibility. Will you get up? Will you pray? Will you go to a deserted place? Will you spend time? Or will you just keep hitting the little button to get one more shock? One more swipe, one more click, one more this, one more that. Or will you become a deeper person by having soulful peace? The last thing I want to tell you is the first peace you need, if you don't have it, is peace with God through Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. Died on a cross so that you could receive him as your savior. His blood could wash you clean of your sin. and He could live in your heart so that you would go to heaven when you die and know him as your savior. That's peace with God through Christ. You just pray and ask Jesus to be your savior and forgive your sins. We'll have folks that can talk to you about that as well. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We know the statistics are true. We feel them in our heart. But just as one author said, we don't want to have the undisciplined pursuit of more. We want to have the disciplined pursuit of less so that we can discern what's really good and really needed. The door will always have a knock on it. There'll always be one more email in our inbox, one more text in our feed, one more thing to buy for the house, one more food to put in the fridge. One more movie to see, another song to listen to, another concert to go to, another game, all wonderful, great things. But Lord, we want to lay down those one more things and say, I've got something better to do. I've got a soul that needs some tending, and I need a will of God move in my life to show me what I was made to do. So we pray, Father, for more in 24, more peace. We're too busy, and it's our responsibility to carve out the time of rest and margin, nobody else's. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you stand with me? It's gonna be a temptation for those of y'all that are super busy. You gotta get out of here three minutes early. What if God's got something for you and while we sing this three-minute song, my name would be that long, of Lord, I need you. And to let God do his work in your life. Let's sing this together. There's folks down front, folks at the cross aisle, Folks in the balcony, they'd love to talk with you, pray with you about anything you need prayer on. Let's pray together, and sing together, and respond together as we worship. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. God, how I need you. And Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. And you're the God.
Thank you all so much for joining us this week and we really have loved having you here and we want to continue to be able to connect with you throughout the week um, and moving forward as well. And so there's ways for us to be able to do that. If you have anything that you want us to be praying over or to get you plugged in more with the church, you can text prayer to 44322 and that's just a way for us to be able to reach out to you and for you to feel more connected within the church. So you can follow us on social media by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, going to Instagram as well as on Facebook too. And this just gives you an opportunity to continue through messages, hearing testimonies and so many other things. And so we want to be here for you in whatever way we can. We hope that you have an amazing week and we look forward to seeing you very soon.